this paper is called uh, Can the Child Penalty Be Reduced? Evaluating Multiple Policy Reforms, and it's joint work with Emily Mix, who's at the University of Southern uh, California. I was really hoping to have some new, new results ready for you by now, but unfortunately, even uh, with statistics, no, it's, uh, it can be delays in getting access to data, so we haven't been able to get that. But uh, uh, we are currently revising this paper, uh, and I'll discuss towards the end of the presentation in what direction we, we, we will be taking it, and, and I'm very open to, uh, to input uh, on that. I'm open to questions uh, during the talk or, or, or afterwards, whatever you please. So, so this paper be begins with its, this very uh, common finding, and I, here we are. Common finding that you're probably aware by now that child penalties are large and very persistent. And this, this uh, I'm going to use the term child penalties to just simply refer to the empirical pattern that it, it seems to be the case that uh, women reduce their labor supply a lot following birth, while no such drop is apparent among men. And while the term child penalty may, may sound like a bad thing, uh, I'm not inferring that here. I'm using it purely to, to describe this empirical pattern that you see uh, in these, these figures. And across the world, in, uh, in particular in, developing, in developed countries, uh, this pattern has been found to be very strong and very persistent. And this can be found in, in, um, in fairly liberal and progressive countries such as Scandinavia, uh, in Central Europe, in Anglo-Saxon countries, and now we're also have increasing evidence that this is a, a consistent pattern in developing countries. At the same time, we also know that the child penalty or ch child-related inequality now explains a majority of the remaining gender gap. This, this composition exercise is probably familiar to a lot of you. This is from a, a paper of Cleven and co-authors, and they decompose using blind Rooksaka decompositions the, uh, the uh, gender gap into factors that can be uh, explained by education, factors can be, that can be explained by, uh, by children, and the residual. And what we see here is that over time the child-related inequality has been fairly stable, perhaps even increasing somewhat, while the other types of, of inequality uh, has been decreasing in magnitude. So the takeaway is that now in Denmark in 2012, something like 80% of the child, of, of the remaining gap in earnings between women and men are related to children. So this, of course, makes it crucial if we want to further reduce uh, the gender wage gap. Uh, children is where we need to, uh, to address, uh, address policy. So what we do in this paper is that we, we document how the child penalty has changed considerably in Norway over a very long time period. So we start in 1970, which is uh, uh, about as far back as uh, anyone has gone in this, this literature, and we go all the way to 2014. And we document how this child penalty was much larger uh, previously, and has been reduced considerably over time. And these uh, changes have correlated strongly with major welfare reforms uh, in Norwegian society, begging the question whether this is correlation or causation. Is it actually these uh, family policies that induce the reductions in child penalty? And that's precisely what we tackle in the second part of the paper, where we actually estimate the impact of two policies uh, in reducing the child penalty. And these are important policies that receive a lot of false attention, in particular paternity leave and high quality subsidized early childcare. Uh, and then uh, in the end, we also estimate the impact of paternity leave in particular on a new measure of paternity norms, which is precisely the take up of future uh, paternity leave for future children. Another way to measure how uh, women and men share the distribution of, of uh, household work related to, uh, to children. So we contribute to, to three strands of the literature. And the first is uh, the child penalty literature, which is now very, very large and covers uh, covers estimates from a range of countries across the world. I know that uh, Henry Cleven and co-authors are now in the process of constructing something they call the child penalty atlas. So they are gathering these estimates from across the world uh, in a unified uh, framework to be able to compare this across uh, geography. But the basic takeaway is that these child penalties are large across uh, countries, time and subgroups. So this is a very, very persistent empirical pattern. In previous work, we've looked at, uh, at same-sex and adopting couples to try to understand why this is the case. And the work we do uh, in this paper builds on that uh, paper now published in the Journal of Labor Economics. And we contribute to this, uh, this strand of literature by estimating a long history of child penalties. Of course, if you're working in this literature, you should by now be very familiar with the feeling of being uh, second to Henry Cleven. Uh, so he did this for the US uh, very recently. Uh, but apart from him, uh, our paper is, to the best of our knowledge, the, all the paper to go this far back. Uh, 
And we document how there's been drastic reductions in the child penalty uh, from 1970 to 1990, and then some level of stagnation, and then more modest reductions after 1995. 1995. And these correlate with very major welfare reforms uh, in Norway, begging the question whether these actually caused these reductions. Let me contribute to the literature on paternity leave, which has basically showed fairly mixed results. Uh, some most papers find zero effects on earnings, some find positive effects on earnings. Um, uh, but importantly, if you're interested in a child penalty, we need to consider effects on both parents' earnings. So you could have, in principle, positive effects on, on mother's earnings, while at the same time also positive effects on father's earnings, and the, the, uh, the child penalty wouldn't change. So, so this is sort of crucial to investigate both parents' response and their relative response in order, in order to understand how the child penalty changes. There's also some very promising work on short-term impacts at other margins such as a, a more equal distribution of household work or better maternal health after a, a, a one month uh, daddy quota in, in Sweden. But it's still unclear if these policies really impact long term preferences for, for sharing the burden of children more, more equally. And here we contribute by pooling a large number of paternity leave reforms for Norway and estimate fairly precise zeros. And we also do this thing I mentioned where we evaluate uh, the impact on a new measure of paternity norms, namely future take up of leave. Um, and then finally, we contribute to the uh, literature on subsidized early child care. And this is a humongously large literature, so I'm not going to summarize it, but there are a number of surveys around. But most relevant for this paper is the papers by Havnes and Mugsta that uh, evaluates the 1975 reform with respect to maternal labor supply. Uh, and that's one reform that sort of correlates strongly with a, with a drop in child penalties uh, in Norway. And my own paper, Tari Havnes, that evaluates the 2002 reform. And we're going to base uh, our uh, uh, child care application on the, on the same rollout. And compared to this literature, we contribute by estimating the impact on the child penalty directly and showing that there are, we find, uh, uh, tendencies towards a, a reduction in the child penalty, but, uh, despite the fact that both estimates for fathers and mothers are uh, on their own insignificant. So uh, some background on Norway. Norway is a very well developed welfare state. Um, our maternity leave system dates all the way, way back to some time in the 1930s. There were sizable expansions in 1977 and a series of expansions in the 80s that uh, correlates, as you will see uh, in a little while, with, with these uh, drops in the child penalty. Then we introduced a paternity leave quota as one of the first countries in the world in 1983. And this was a take it or leave it four week uh, paternity leave. So if the father didn't take it, then the mother couldn't uh, take it up. And this has been gradually expanded in the 2000s, which are the reforms we're going to exploit in this paper. And it's now at 15 weeks. So it's, it's split here three. It's 15 weeks for the, uh, for the fathers, 16 weeks to share, and then uh, 18 weeks for the mothers uh, today. We also have a very well-developed and highly subsidized formal care system uh, following two reforms, one in 1975, which is this reform that Havnes and Mugsta uh, exploited, and one in 2002, which is the reform we are exploiting in this paper. Now, as I said, parents are entitled to very generous leave. Uh, so when you become uh, parents, you're entitled to 49 weeks of leave at 100% replacement, or 59 weeks of leave at 80% replacement, replacement rates. These are capped, but the cap is fairly high. Uh, and then also quite a few employers, they do top up so that the cap doesn't really bind. Uh, and then, as I said, there's a 15 week quota for each per parent in addition to three weeks before birth for the mothers and the remaining third is, is shared uh, bet between the parents. And in order to be eligible, you need to, there's some minimum requirements of, of fast earnings. But this is fairly low. 50,000 50, Norwegian kroners is, is not that much. It's around 5,000 euros uh, over a year. Uh, and then you also need to be working six out of the 10 uh, preceding months. But then things like sickness, absence, and, uh, and uh, uh, full-time study, that counts as work for this eligibility requirement. So the eligibility criteria is not that strict. Uh, but there's also a one-time benefit that mothers can get if they don't qualify. But that is very low. It's at 90,000 uh, kroners, which is uh, below anything you would ever get if you if you qualify. So typically, nobody will choose this one-time benefit uh, if they do qualify. 
Unfortunately, there is no individual eligibility for fathers. So for the very small set of, of couples where the mothers don't qualify and take this one-time benefit, neither does the father get uh, any leave, which is a source of some frustration uh, among uh, a number of parents every, every year. Now for childcare, we do have a very general uh, subsidized uh, system uh, and the cost is capped. So there's max price and that's around 3000 kroners a month per child and there's even a sibling uh, rebate. So it's very cheap and it covers around 12% of the total cost. So this is highly, highly subsidized by uh, state and municipal funds. Uh, and these, these uh, subsidies however, are available both for private and public suppliers. So it's sort of a dual market where uh, private suppliers can also uh, um, provide these services. But if they do, then they need to adhere to fairly strict quality start standards, at least observe related to the observable dimensions, such as child to staff ratio, opening of hours, playing space per child. So I like to think about this child care sector as at least fairly uniform in terms of quality on the observable dimensions. And these days readily available, but in the past it's been quite strongly rationed in periods. And this is what we exploit in the, in the child care application. In addition, there's a cash for care benefit, which used to be in the majority of the uh, study pe period, this used to be around 3000 kroners per month. So basically uh, the same uh, price as the, the same as you pay for childcare roughly. And this is given to, uh, to children who don't attend public, publicly subsidized childcare institutions. Uh, this might, may sound like a, a weird thing to do, basically subsidizing people not to use a public service, uh, but th this is sort of a label, uh, promoted under a freedom of choice uh, agenda where for some political parties it's important to provide, to allow parents to, to choose freely whether or not they want to send their child uh, to childcare. Now, um, you're probably aware that Norwegian registered data is, is considered to be a fairly, fairly good quality and we benefit from this data and we pull together a lot of different data sources. And the, the best thing about these registers is that there are unique identifiers in every single register. This means we can connect people across registers and we can also connect people to family. So you can see who are your mother and father and we can see your siblings and therefore also see other related family members. We measure, we use the cash for care register to measure who takes up this cash for care benefit and thus uh, we uh, infer that everyone who doesn't, they are uh, using childcare because this is very generous. We use tax records to measure uh, annual pensionable income all the way back to 1967 and this is fairly this is a very long historical panel which allows us to do do this very long uh, historical uh, child penalties on real panel data not just quasi panels like Cleveland does in for the US we have education registers population registers that allows us to see uh, basic stuff like where you live and who your mother and father are your birth, your your gender and so on and then importantly, we have a number of data uh, points from what's called the FDA Trigd uh, database. And that importantly for this project, it contains all leaves of parental leave uh, starting in 1992. So we can see actually uh, when you went on leave and when you return uh, to work for paid leave spells. So this is a very vast uh, uh, data set that allows us to do a lot of interesting stuff. And it's generally considered a fairly high quality. Now. We're going to use four different samples in this paper, uh, sort of mirroring that we're trying to do uh, a lot of different things. And we even tried to submit this paper on a, on a short paper track in a journal. So you can imagine this was a very hard <laughs> thing to do, to, uh, to do all this, these things in a short paper. But I think this is sort of blend together very, very well. So we're going to use, uh, for, for our three first samples, we're going to focus attention on firstborn singletons, uh, which is in line with the child penalty literature. Uh, and that allows us to define timing of first birth uniquely. We require both parents not to have any kids from before, so that it's the firstborn for both parents. And then we put a restriction on age so that we can meaningfully observe some labor market outcomes before birth and after birth. Uh, but these are fairly mild. And then in the long run sample, we use all kids born all the way from 1970 to 2014. So that's a sample of something like 600,000 children. We have some challenges here in observing earnings if, if you have zero earnings. And zero earnings is clearly an important margin of response for the child penalty. Uh, that's, that means we, we think it's, it's likely that extensive margin is important. So what we do to solve that is infer that you had zero earnings if you're missing from this data, because that would not be recorded. 
as long as you're born in Norway and didn't immigrate before our sample window starts uh, and are still alive and didn't emigrate until after our sample uh, window ends. And we, we think this is sort of fairly, a fairly good proxy for measuring zero earnings. For a paternity leave sample, we need to focus on, uh, on kids that are born in the years where these reforms happen. I'm going to cover the reforms in more detail later, but this is 2005, 6, 9, 11, 13, and 14, covering a total of something like 90,000 kids. And then because we have this problem with individual eligibility for fathers, then we include only couples where the mother took some leave. We think this is a, while it might sound like an endogenous sample selection, we think really no mothers are choosing not to take leave if they are eligible. So we're using this more as a measure of eligibility than actual choice, because we think it's reasonable that nobody opts out of this benefit if you're eligible. And then for the formal care sample, we need to, to, to use the kids that are born in the years that would make them exposed to this gradual rollout that happened across geography and time after the 2002 reform. And this means we're going to use the kids born in 2001 through 2006. And we measure the municipality of treatment as the municipality where you lived uh, on January 1st in the year you will eventually turn to, so for, before this treatment uh, set in. And for our final empirical analysis, uh, we use this paternity norms sample, and then we're going to measure uh, fathers who get children around the time of these paternity leave reforms, and then go on to get another child, so we can measure how much uh, paternity leave they choose to take out later on. And then we use all fathers and not just first time fathers in order to increase sample size because now samples are getting fairly thin. And they also need to have another child at the latest in 2014 so that we can measure uh, paternity leave takeout, which is the outcome variable in, in this application. All right, so let's, uh, I'm going to review the identifying assumptions and the sort of empirical strategies uh, before presenting the results for each of these uh, applications. And the event study design with child penalty results are going to build on a very familiar, I hope, uh, event uh, study model like this. And this has by now become fairly uh, common in the literature on, on child penalties. And we express it this way to highlight the comparison to a to regular diff and diff. So the basically what we do is we take a panel of uh, these parents who will eventually uh, get a child in the year uh, EI. And we, re we regress their earnings in this panel around that time on uh, event time dummies and then a separate set of event time dummies for mothers, gender age profiles and gender yearly shocks. And this basically, and then we cluster standard errors on the, on the couple in order to account for the fact that we uh, use the same uh, person multiple times and incomes might be correlated across people in the same couple and over time. And our child is simply these alpha estimates. And of course, common trends is, is underlying the, the identifying assumptions here. And we're not aiming to identify earnings dynamics. So the earnings dynamics would be each individual parent's response to the event of giving birth. And that's what's typically uh, uh, the target parameter in a regular event study setup. We argue that this is very challenging to identify, and I think most child penalty papers sort of implicitly does this, but we think that uh, the specification on the previous slide highlights how this is really just a different diff thing. So if we would identify earnings dynamics and give it a causal interpretation, we would require very strong assumptions. We would require no anticipation and parallel trends, not across women and men in the same couple, but across uh, women who would eventually get their first child at the, in different years. So for instance, a woman who will uh, eventually have her first child in 2005 would have followed the same trend as a woman who will eventually have her first child in 2010, if none of them had ever had a child. And we think that's a very strong assumption uh, and typically valid by pre-trends, which are strongly upward sloping in our application and in, in most others. We think it's considerably easier to identify the child penalties, which are the differences in these responses for mothers versus fathers. And incidentally, that's also what we're interested in. The child penalty is fundamentally a relative thing between the response of mothers versus fathers. And that requires common trends, not across cohorts of first birth, but across spouses in the same couple. So it basically says that uh, mothers and fathers would have followed the same trend in earnings had neither of them had uh, children. And this can typically be valid by looking at the differences in pre-trends uh, across mothers and fathers. <clears throat> 
So this is by now uh, fairly common in the literature, but we think this this is much con it's considerably easier to identify these uh, child penalties than to identify the individual responses. Now we're going to present some some figures in this paper that, that plots lo long run child uh, uh, child penalties, and then it's challenging to present something that's dynamic. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct a summary measure, which is what we call the five year child penalty. So what what other people do is present what they call the long run child penalties. Uh, our sample uh, window isn't that long. We're doing uh, four years before birth and five years after. So we don't think we're necessarily there where we can get to the long run estimates. So what we do instead is, is we take, simply take the sum of all these child penalty estimates and we scale them by the prediction, uh, excluding the event time dummies. And that's the interpretation here is the relative drop in earnings for mothers versus fathers as a percentage of our counterfactual earnings in the way, excluding the event time dummies. And we're also interested in how these uh, child penalties or even the cumulative child penalty uh, is affected by a policy. And now imagine that we had a causal estimate, let's call it gamma, for how a particular policy affects uh, a parent of type M, mothers or fathers, in an event year J. Then by construction of the child penalty, the change in, in, in uh, the child penalty from one unit of that policy must be uh, given by this expression down here, which is simply the effect in the particular year you're looking at for mothers, net of the same effect for fathers, and then for consistency also in netting out any effect if there is one uh, in the year before birth, which is the base year of, uh, of the event study. And it's also possible to scale that by, uh, we scale that by the, the child penalty, which is in measured in kroners, and then we get the percentage change for a one unit uh, a change in the policy. So this is just one way of presenting and scaling these estimates in order to ease uh, interpretation. Now, finally, let me get the results. These are the estimated child penalties in our two samples. And I think this should be very, very familiar to you, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on this, but what we see here is the very familiar pattern that the, the trends are relatively similar up until birth. They are admittedly uh, significantly different from zero, which indicates that mothers in these samples tend to have a slightly steeper wage growth leading up to birth than fathers, but that pretrend is relatively small. We plan on doing some bounding exercises to look at how much this violation could, could affect our estimates, and I'm pretty sure the takeaway from those exercises will be that this vast drop you see after birth cannot be explained away by these small violations of common trends that you see. This is also very typical in the child penalties literature. People typically find violations of these trends. In contrast, uh, you find very sharp drops following birth, in the in the ballpark of 100,000 kroners or 10,000 euros uh, and above. Uh, and you can see that these child penalties are very similar across our two samples. Not surprising because they're sort of from about the same time. The only thing that sort of differs is that it sets in more uniformly for the for, for the uh, paternity leave uh, sample. And that's because uh, paternity leave uh, uh, kids are by construction born around the timing of their forms, which is July 1st. So in the middle of the year, all the formal care sample kids could be born at any time uh, during the year. These results are, are fairly similar and fairly in line with previous findings. Now, turning to the, this long run, this long time dimension, uh, this figure plots child penalties over time. And now we've uh, turned to the five year cumulative child penalty, which sums over these event times in the five years following birth. And what we see here is that the, the child penalty used to be uh, massive in Norway in the, in the ballpark of 80% uh, drops in uh, women's total earnings over and above men's uh, relative to, to her counterfactual back in the 1970s. And this decreased quite a lot uh, over the years, 1970 through 1992-3, something like that. And interestingly, this correlates very strongly with important reforms of welfare reform in Norway. So the two vertical lines here are major reforms to childcare, and the dashed and dotted lines shows the overall share of children of different ages that attend uh, childcare institutions. So what you see here is that the 1975 reform uh, induced very large growth in the share of preschoolers, that's three to six year olds, that attended uh, childcare following that reform. And the 2002 reform induced very large increases in the share of one to two year olds, the youngest kids that attended 
at the neutron field. So it's interesting to ask whether this is correlation or causation. Is this, are these large drops in child penalty caused by this reform or is it just the correlation? And likewise, we had a very major, we had multiple major reforms to the maternity leave system back in the 70s and 80s when these large reductions in the child care, uh, uh, child penalty happened. So what you see here in dotted red lines is the, the number of weeks of, of uh, maternity leave measured on the right hand axis. And you can see a major increase from 12 to 18 weeks in 1977. And then a series of, of uh, reforms, each increasing the leave length by two or three weeks in the 80s. And this also correlates very strongly uh, with, uh, with, um, with the drop in the child penalty. Now, of course, these are correlations and we don't know whether it's causal. And next, therefore, we turn to the period where we actually have uh, arguably plausible exogenous variation in, in some of these reforms. So this figure here just zooms in on the period where we actually have exogenous variation. And you can see that there has been indeed some reductions in the child penalty in Norway in the 2000s as well, from something like 26, 7 percent in the early 2000s and then decreasing to 17, 18 percent in the, in the late 2000s. And again, it's sort of interesting to ask whether this large increase in childcare coverage for toddlers that happened following the 2002 reform could be behind this decrease, or whether these changes in maternity and paternity leave could be uh, behind this decrease. What you see here is that in the 2000s, we had a series of uh, extensions to the paternal quota. First increased by one week, and all the week in 2006, and then the major reform in 2009, increasing by four weeks, and two more reforms, and then a drop back down to 10 weeks. And from the from the red line, you can also see that some of these expansions came at the expense of maternity leave, while others were actually just added on top of the total leave length, so that nothing happened to uh, the total leave that the mother could take out, given that she took everything, which is typically the case. So this is what we turn to next, investigating whether some of these reductions are are causal. So let me start with paternity leave, and I'm going to spend most time uh, on that, because that's where we think we have the strongest result. This is just a table showing a series of paternity leave expansions uh, in this period, which occurred first introduction in 1993, and then gradual expansions, and then contraction in 2014. So this year is the paternity leave uh, quota increased, sometimes at the expense of mothers, and sometimes uh, by just adding more weeks to the total leave length. So what we're going to do is, of course, to use these reforms in a series of fuzzy regression discontinuity designs. We put up a fairly standard fuzzy RD model where uh, an outcome, uh, let's say the annual earnings of an individual father or mother in a particular time around birth, is regressed on uh, a measure of, uh, of the weeks of leave that this father take out. And we instrument that with whether or not you're to the right uh, or left of this quota. We control flexibly for these uh, local linear regressions in order only to exploit variation at the cutoff. And instead of using a single indicator that you would do typically in a regular RD setup, we use the measure of quota here. And the reason for doing that is to get comparable uh, first stage estimates across these reforms. Remember, some of these reforms increased the quota by one week, some by two, some by four, and one of them even reduced the quota by four weeks. So if you would get a dummy, you would, if you would use a dummy, you would need to rescale those parameters afterwards. By using the actual quota, uh, we scale automatically, so it's easy to interpret. But it's, it's using the exactly the same identifying variation. And we use sort of the specification that's by now become fairly common in the literature. We use the, uh, the bandwidth that uh, optimally reduces the mean squared error and triangular weights. Uh, and we interpret here, importantly, our compliers to this instrument are fathers who are rather unwilling to use uh, to use uh, the quota. And it's going to be quite different from the from the compliers to our uh, formal care uh, application, because of course these fathers were free to take more than the quota. They could take some of the shared leave, but they choose not to, or they're not able to negotiate that with their spouse or something like that. But when they're given a non-transferable quota, then they take it. So it's sort of reluctant takers that are the compliers to our, our instrument. And we close to send the errors at, at birth date, which is the running variable. Now with RDs, you typically want things to be not to be manipulated around the cutoff, and that's absolutely the case. Both when pooling all these densities and when estimating them separately, we find absolutely no evidence that mothers or fathers are able to plan conception. 
These reforms were also announced less than nine months in, in advance, typically as part of the budgeting process. So it would be pretty hard to plan conception. And there's also no evidence that they're sort of uh, induced or delayed uh, uh, births or something like that that would cause uh, uh, manipulation around here. We also need uh, balancing. So we would another test that's typically done in RD is that you try to to regress uh, to use your RD model with uh, with some background covariate as an outcome. And if that's uh, unbalanced, then you're worried that there's uh, endogenous selection into or out of treatment. And this table roughly shows that that's uh, not the worry with one exception. And that exception is, is highlighted in, in uh, brown here, and that's weeks of maternity leave. And that's really not surprising. You saw that some of these reforms, they really expanded care at the expense of the mothers, and others increased them. And what we see here is that we find significant reduction reductions in maternity leave takeout, exactly for the reforms that expanded care at the expense of mothers and not for others. So this could be a possible violation of exclusion if these weeks of maternity leave also affect uh, outcomes, but we're not too worried about that. Remember that these weeks of leave are taken from a very large margin. It would be reductions from 38 to 35 or 31, some very large number of weeks. And we believe that, that relatively long leaves don't, it's, it's likely to think that they don't have a major uh, effect. Furthermore, we do a robustness check where we instrument for both, both of these things, exploiting the fact that some of these reforms uh, affect only one and, and some affect the other, and we find very similar results. So we're not too worried about this. I like this figure uh, very much. It shows how conservative Norwegian fathers are, unfortunately, in taking exactly the quota and nothing more. So this is a series of first stage uh, regressions, and on the top you have the actual quota. So in 2005, on July 1st, the quota increased from four to five weeks, and what you see is that fathers who got their child exactly on July 1st they take exactly five weeks, where the fathers before take exactly four weeks. So basically, the Norwegian fathers take only the quota. And the exact same, same thing happened in 2006, another week increase. In 2009, four weeks increase. In 2011, two more weeks. In 2013, two more weeks. And then the Norwegian prime minister was somehow convinced that now we don't need the quota anymore, because now Norwegian fathers have learned and preferences have changed, and we can give, back their, give them the choice back to share it as they want. So she reduced the quota to 10 weeks, and lo and behold, what happened? It dropped right back down to 10 weeks. So it's no surprise that this, is, this instrument is very strong, but it basically induces fathers to take the leave because it's take it or leave it. Uh, and it, there's very little evidence here to, to say that preferences have sort of changed in the long run by looking at that. Now, we're going to find zero effects here, and therefore we, we want precise zeros rather than imprecise zeros. And it's not clear how best to to combine these reforms. Um, so uh, the naive way to do it would be to just recenter the running variable and put all the data on top of each other and run the specification I showed you uh, before. Uh, but we argued that that doesn't really control for the running variable. That forces you to, to estimate a single local linear polynomial on each side. But if in reality, this local linear polynomial is trying to control the way for the differences that people born to the left and the right of the cutoff would be having independently of how much lead they took. So typically, if you do the pooled model, you're not only going to identify the effect from actual threshold crossing, but also from comparisons across years. And we think that's unfortunate. It doesn't properly control uh, for the running variable. So an, an alternative would be just to use these six reforms, and then they just weight them, weight the, the coefficients by their relative sample size. We think that's unfortunate too, because it doesn't exploit the fact that some of the, these reforms are much more precisely estimated than others, in particular the ones where you would have larger shifts in the quota. So our, instead, our preferred stack model takes all the individual models and put them on top of each other and estimates them all separately. And, uh, and the only restriction we make then is that the treatment, there's one single treatment of, uh, of, uh, of these reforms, uh, and it's restricted to be the same across reforms. And what OLS does then, by, by the properties of OLS, it produces an inverse variance weighted average of each reform. So that the reform that would produce a more precise IV estimate also get more uh, weight in our average. And we think that's a reasonable thing to do because we're trying to get precise zero here, zeros here in order to say something substantial. So that's our preferred model. And if we do that with the first stage, it looks like this. So you can see that the pooled uh, estimate is 0.85, indicating that for every additional uh, quota 
uh, of leave, Fox would take out 0.85 more weeks. This is an important number as a policymaker if you're thinking about the cost of providing these, uh, this reform, then, then it's important to know whether this is actually taken up or not, because it's not, if it's not taken up, then it's really not a cost for, this, for, this, for the government either. Uh, and here the F statistic is ridiculously large because we're also exploiting variation across years and not only at the threshold. The weighted average, uh, however, is very similar in terms of size, but has much less precision. While our preferred estimate is also very similar in size, but has much higher F statistic because it uh, appropriately weights the, uh, the more precise reforms strong, more strongly. So moving on to income, we find nothing. So these are uh, ID estimates on the annual incomes in each year indicated by the x-axis for mothers uh, with the red uh, lines and for fathers with the blue lines. And the numbers on the y-axis is in thousands of Norwegian kroners, so roughly, uh, roughly um, uh, hundreds of euros. So this year is absolutely no effect. Uh, and you also see that position is higher among women, while for men there's more imprecision in these estimates. Uh, now, if we do this and we, we take the estimates at time minus one and at uh, various times uh, after birth, and we, uh, we calculate the share of the child penalty this would reduce, we get some very small numbers. Uh, so, uh, at the very best, if you take the top of the 25% confidence interval, this would reduce the child penalty by something like 5 to 7% per week of paternity leave. So one would love more precision, and we're going to add more reforms in the new iteration of this paper in hopes of getting even more precision. We still think there's very little evidence here to think that paternity leave has any long-term impact uh, on, uh, on, uh, on earnings. Now, before moving on to childcare, uh, we also look at this other measure of paternity norms. You can imagine that, that uh, well, perhaps mothers and fathers, they don't really respond by changing the distribution of labor supply. But they could, they could change other stuff more equally. They could share the household work more equally. They could pick up in childcare more, uh, more equally. They could do all these other chores that we don't observe uh, in earnings more equally. Well, one measure of those norms are the actual leave takeout for future kids. So imagine how these fathers take some leave and they're forced to take more of it because they're exposed to the reform. They might turn out to like it and they might choose to take more leave later on and, and that would perhaps be an indication that they're, uh, they're more progressive in terms of norms and their preferences have changed. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. What we do here is we use the leave takeout for the next children as an outcome, and we use the same stacked uh, and pooled and weighted RD specification. And to the far right, you have our preferred stacked estimate. And you can see that's actually negative. So if you take, take it at, at face value, the point estimate suggests that for every additional week that the father was induced to take because of the quota, he takes uh, 0.12 less weeks of leave on his next child. And then, of course, he's not necessarily restricted by the quota anymore. And by, uh, by looking at the top of the 95% confidence interval, we can rule out effects larger than something like 0.09 uh, weeks, which is, is very small. So there's absolutely no indication that fathers respond to this by taking more leave later on, which is an at least somewhat novel measure in the literature, uh, trying to capture how these couples sort of share this overall burden of, of kids. Moving on to the, yeah, let's just move on. Move on to the, the other application on childcare. I'm gonna be a bit more brief because eventually we're most likely going to drop this application from the paper uh, at the advice of a very smart uh, editor. So, so this is probably the last time you will, you will see this particular application, but we exploit the 2002 childcare reform. That was basically a broad bipartisan agreement where all the parties in the Norwegian parliament agreed that uh, they should join together to expand access to childcare. In particular, there was a lot of rationing and undersupply of care for toddlers. So there was a lot of mothers and fathers who couldn't get childcare for their child and therefore presumably stayed home uh, to take care of themselves because there was really no or a very small alternative market. And what the reform did was that it increased subsidies to running and starting new childcare institutions. And the subsequent expansion following this turned out to vary a lot across municipalities and over time. And we argue that this variation is um, uncorrelated to underlying trends in female uh, labor supply in particular. Uh, and we build this on, uh, on a series of reports by a consultancy firm called Aspen Wehack that, that follow these municipalities in their 
uh, in their goal towards providing full coverage. And their argument is consistently that it's really unpredictable factors that, such as unpredictable population growth and uh, and stuff like that, that led to these uh, unforeseen delays, rather than really structural factors that could be uncorrelated, could be correlated with, with time trends. We show in a previous paper that these expansions do seem to be uncorrelated to long-term determinants of labor supply trends, and therefore think about these expansions as sort of uh, cause are randomly taking the lid off this really pent up Russian demand for, for job care. So this is what the, the, the levels of, of care availability in Norwegian municipalities look like over this period. What you can see is that this, it, it, it increased a lot, but this increase was very different across municipalities. So it happened at different times. And that's what we're, uh, we're exploiting in this IV setup. So what we do here is that we're using calendar year and municipality fixed effects. And then we're uh, measuring how much care you use from 13 to 36 months of age. And we instrument that with the care availability at two crucial points in time. Namely, uh, the autumn uh, in the year you turn one and the autumn in the year you turn two. And uh, the idea here is that we're comparing children who happen to grow up in the municipality that increased availability a lot exactly in the area where you would need it. Uh, to another child that grew up a year before or a year later or in another municipality that didn't have that shock in that particular year. And in contrast to the paternity leave expansion, our compliers here are very willing, but constrained users. So these are parents who would like to have care, but it's Russian, so they can't get it. Uh, so this is a very different complier group, which could perhaps explain some of the differences we find. First stage estimates are unsurprisingly very strong. Expansions of care do uh, lead kids to take it up uh, and the coefficients can be interpreted here as, as years so that if if they expand a lot in the autumn when you turn one which is a time when many kids will typically start care for the first time then you benefit a lot because there's a longer period where you can attend toddler care so typically then on average you'll attend one more year of care or if they expand a lot the following autumn then you also benefit but you can't reap the rewards for as long so the coefficient is smaller Looking at IV results, we find, uh, unfortunately, uh, not as precise results as we would like, but you can see some tendency to this uh, deviation of mothers versus fathers uh, in the years following uh, birth. And the ages one to three, which is precisely the time when these kids use this extra care, you see uh, mothers' uh, labor supply increasing slightly and fathers decreasing. But none of these are independently statistically significant. However, when we uh, do them together and calculate the combined effects on the child penalty, we do find indications that, that the not the year of childcare reduces the child penalty, uh, in particular uh, at age three, which is towards the end of this period when you actually uh, experience these uh, additional care use. So this is at least suggestive evidence that there seems to be more uh, effect in really taking this lid off or, or, or uh, reducing this rationing for these willing parents who have to stay, stay home when, when children, when childcare is not available. But then again, after a period of active use, when the child turns four and everyone basically have access to care, then this effect goes away. Another, uh, another reason why we think that it's very hard to change preferences or norms in the long term. The reason why this works is partly because there were a bunch of, of willing users who were rationed and when we gave them care, they started uh, working, but nothing really changed afterwards when they all had care anyway. So this is sort of the story. Let me wrap up. Here is basically the conclusion. We find evidence that paternity leave, that we find no evidence that paternity leave works on the child penalty, neither by affecting mother's or father's labor supply from very, despite very, very strong first stages that shifts fathers into the use uh, of, uh, of paternity leave. And we find suggestive evidence at least that, uh, that these childcare expansions in the early 2000s actually do reduce the child penalty, in particular during the years of use, because the parents are then rationed and typically uh, when they don't have access to care, the mothers are the one who will stay home. But when they do, they work more and the child penalty is reduced in the short term. But in the longer term, neither does the, uh, these, uh, these uh, policies reduce the child penalty. So, well, yeah, then we also show this historical uh, evidence, but let me just spend one minute on what we want to do from here. Uh, and that's uh, that we want to focus exclusively, of, uh, exclusively on uh, paternity leave. We think we can provide a more, uh, a more clear uh, story for paternity leave only. 
We want to add more reforms in order to get more precision. Um, and then we want to do two more expansions. And the first is we want to look at intergenerational effects. That's yet another way to measure whether these reforms could perhaps affect norms or preferences in among women and men. So one way to do that is to use the first 93 reform and, and see how the children of these fathers behave when they themselves become uh, parents. So now there's been enough years since 93 and there's a number of thousands of these uh, exposed children who have now gone on to get children of their own. And then it's interesting, of course, to look at how do they share leave? How do they their child penalties look like? So we want to add that. Uh, we suspect uh, it's not going to work there either, but that will provide another piece of evidence, uh, perhaps that, that these things are hard to change, unfortunately, uh, in particular by paternity leave. And the second thing we want to do is to explore one potential reason why we think perhaps uh, paternity leave failed to provide these uh, effects, and that's timing of leave. Uh, so one suggested explanation for why paternity leave doesn't work is that fathers have a lot of leave away. When exactly do they take this leave? And in particular, they're, they're, it's possible for them to take this leave when the, mo the mothers are also at home, for instance, during uh, uh, during uh, vacations or other periods when the mother doesn't work. So if there's some way that a lot of these unwilling fathers, the way they take up the leave actually prohibits them from taking sole responsibility for child rearing, then perhaps that could be one reason why it doesn't work as intended. So what we want to do is investigate uh, the patterns of, of take up of leave, and if it turns out that Paternity leave is uniquely concentrated, for instance, during the summer, when many families have a, a long extended vacation together, then the interpretation of that finding could perhaps be, be quite different if fathers isn't really taking sole responsibility for child rearing. That also opens up a case for, for stricter uh, activation requirements, perhaps uh, enforcing fathers only to be allowed to take leave if the mother is actually actively working or, or something like that. Uh, so, so investigating when fathers take this leave, and this builds sort of an anecdotal evidence that you hear that I've heard that some some fathers use this to repaint the garage or do something that you know is super important in the house, but doesn't really change any anything in relation to the kids. So that's sort of the direction we want to take this, and I'm uh, I'm eager. To